Okay, folks, we want a more Bible study with our dear Pastor Rick Rodrig. And this is the probably the thirteenth time we've been recording, okay? And so and the topic I see today is the secret to understand the revelation. Wonderful subject. <laughs> Pastor Rick, thank you very much. Go ahead, please, okay? Thank you. God bless you, man. Thank you. I, don't know how you, I don't know how you knew that was a subject. That was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> See that? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Amen. Let's just take a minute right now. Let's just let's ask the Lord to bless this, this meeting again tonight. Amen. Lord, we ask that you touch this study tonight, Lord God. Yes, Lord. Touch our hearts. Yes. Touch our minds. Amen. Touch our souls. Amen. Touch our spirits. Amen. Touch us, Lord God. Yes, God, touch we us. We will receive something from your word tonight, Lord God. Amen. We will receive something, Lord God. Your word always puts out, but Lord God, that we would receive it tonight. Amen. That we would receive an understanding that we would receive, Lord God, a blessing from your word tonight. Lord, Amen. we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as you said, the, uh, uh, the, the, the title What's of this study is, is The Secret to Understanding Revelation. And, it, and no. it's a culmination of everything that we've been learning so far, um, of what we've, what, we've, what we've been looking at, studying all the way up through. Um, and Revelation 19 declares, Revelation 19 declares what the Word of God is or who Jesus Christ is. You see, the whole, the whole reasoning behind trying to understand the book of Revelation, the whole reason behind it is to try to understand who Jesus is. Amen. Is to understand Him. You see, a lot of times we, we, we think of, of Him as, as somebody that's away from us, that when we need Him, we take Him down off a shelf and, and, and dust Him off and say, Lord, help me today. But you know... He, he's a friend. He sticks closer than a brother. He's somebody that's with us at all times. He knows all things. He sees all things. He is aware of all things. And not one thing that we ever tell him is a surprise. And so we need to understand who he is. And if we want to understand Revelation, we need to understand Jesus Christ. And if we want to understand Jesus Christ, we need to understand Revelation. Because Revelation chapter 19 tells us... Um, that the revelation of Jesus Christ is the spirit yeah. of prophecy. So Revelations chapter 9 and 19, I'm sorry, chapter 19 and verse 10, chapter 19 verse 10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. He's referring to the angel. I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. That's right. I'm just a fellow servant with you. Yeah, I might be, we think of angels as being these elevated beings. And angels, he's sitting back saying, I'm just your fellow servant. I'm doing the same thing you are. I'm, I'm trying to work for God like you are. Yeah. Okay? I'm a fellow servant with you. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Amen. You see, the angel even is coming back and saying, if you have the testimony of Jesus, then we're brothers. Okay? We're brethren. Worship God. That was a command that he gave me. Worship God. Just because I look like I'm something that's important, just because I have an office that might be a little bit higher than your office, you don't worship me. Amen. Worship Amen. God. Amen. He's the one to worship. For the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit. A prophecy. Whether you understand it or not, whether you have a, a, a handle on it so you can go out and teach somebody all that we've learned so far, or you're still going back and looking at these, these, these uh, uh, recordings and get, gaining more information out of them, going back and restudying them, re-watching, getting more information out of it, whether, whether you're at that point where you know it 100% or you're at that point or you're at that point where, where you're still not 100% sure but you know what you've learned so far and, 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 you, and you have a small grasp of it, whether you understand, understand that the revelation or the testimony of Jesus Christ is 
the spirit of prophecy. So if you want to understand Jesus, start learning the word of God. Amen. Because I, I want you to know, prophecy is throughout the Bible. It's not just in one book called Revelation. Okay? Prophecy is throughout the whole Bible. Prophecy. Prophecy is in Genesis. Chapter 1, where he created man. Prophecy. Believe it or not, that's prophecy. Genesis 1, 20, that's prophecy. Why is that prophecy? Because it says, God created man in his own image. Well, what image is that? God's a spirit. Then it worship must worship in the spirit and in truth. God has no image. He has no, no, no physical attributes like we have. God has no face or no skin. Yet it says God created man in his own image. How could he do that? Because he was looking ahead prophetically at that body he was going to fill Jesus Christ as that body that he was going to become or come into that fleshly man, Christ Jesus, known as the Son of God. That fleshly man that he was going to fill with his spirit and dwell in. It says he created man in his own image. He looked at Adam, or actually, he looked at Jesus when he made Adam. And he said, I'm going to make Adam just like that form that I'm going to take. And he formed him from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and Adam became a living soul because he was using prophecy. Prophecy of what was going to take place 4,000 years down the road. God could see the image of Jesus Christ and he used that image and he made Adam in that image. Uh, you know, uh, you see how God works, okay? He has bring something on board that I felt by God last Sunday, what did I preach about? Prophecy. Prophecy. I was talking about prophets and seers. And that's exactly what God is doing now all over the world. God needs more prophets. He needs people to prophesy. Seer, what is a seer? She is a prophet like Daniel or Joseph who, who, who has the gift of dreaming and interpreting interpreting dreams. Yes. Okay? And God right now, in this this moment, God is recruiting prophets and seers all over the world because the last battle is coming soon. Mm -hmm. and, and all those prophets will you will, will help the Lord guide the church. Okay? That's what we prophets do. That's right. And and that's why I, and what does what does it, what do we, how do we get to be a prophet or a seer? Only by intimacy with the Lord. That's right. There's no other, there's no, no work, no, 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 not, no uh, obligation or sacrifices. The only thing that we have to have is to be God's friend. That's right. You cannot be a prophet or seer if, if you're not God's friend. All the prophets, all the seers, all God's friends, yes. Amen. All of them, and, and so let's let's ask the Lord to, for us to move, continue moving on us, continue moving, okay? Uh, and touching us, and changing us, and disturbing us. And the, the, the Holy Spirit shaking us, disturbing us in a way that we are really moving by His grace, Amen. Amen. I'm sorry. Amen. Oh, that's good. That's good. So the testimony of Jesus Christ is the Spirit. Of prophecy. Now, the spirit of prophecy is just letting us know what is going to take place or letting us know about things that did take place and how they were prophesied that they were going to take place so that we can look at it and see, wow, the word of God is real. Because in order to be a prophet of God, 100% of your prophecies have to come to pass. Yes. 100%. Okay? You can't be wrong on one item. Because if you're wrong on one item, the Bible says they're not a prophet of God. So, yes, you have to have intimacy with the Creator because the intimacy of the Creator is what will give you the understanding or the vision that you need for the day that we're living in. So, you better be intimate with Him. 
Because when you're intimate with him, then you know what it is that he has for his people. Don't, don't, the word of God says, try the spirits to see that they are of God. Try the spirits. Okay? So the word of God says to try the spirits. What does that mean? That means make sure that they are teaching the truth. Okay? Make sure that those spirits are teaching the truth. Make sure that that person that is talking to you is teaching the truth. And how do you know whether they're teaching the truth? Well, you use a standard. You use a standard. And what's a standard? A standard is a way of measuring. It could be a ruler. It could be a yardstick. It could be a, a, a tape measure. It could what, how, Whatever you use to measure, that's a standard. In my case, the standard is the Bible, the Word of God. That's the standard. If somebody is telling you something contrary to the Word of God, then don't believe them. If they're, take, if they're taking the Word of God and only giving you a little bit of it instead of all of it, don't listen to them. Because omission is just as bad as commission. If you commit to a lie, or if you tell somebody something and omit a piece of the truth so they believe something that's actually not true, then either one of those are lies, okay? Commission or omission. So we have to understand the word of God. So let's not, let's just make sure we're careful and that we're teaching the word of God. So the spirit of prophecy, and, and what is, how do we understand the spirit of prophecy? Again, we've learned now, we've been studying this for, for, for quite a few weeks now. Um, this is going to be like an overview, but it's going to let you see how everything flows together. And, and the timings of everything, and how quick the timings flow together. Thank you very much, brother. Mm -hmm. How quick the timings flow together. Okay, so again, we've, we've seen the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is written, it's not written in chronological order, okay? Remember when we first studied, or we first talked about the book of, Re with the book of Revelation, we talked about the book of Revelation was not written in a chronological order of, from start to finish, all these things happened in a particular straight-on timeline. There are bits and pieces inside of Revelation that are in a, uh, uh, a, a timeline, but they end at a certain point, and then they start telling you about something else that started before it, and brings you up to that point again, and it starts telling you about something else that started here, and brings you up to that point. It all ends at the same place, which is the wrath of God, oh, but it all is talking about you know, starting from different points, and that's what the book of Revelation is. So, there's three particular categories according to the book of Revelation. Three categories in the book of Revelation. Number one, in Revelation chapter one, verse 19, he said, here, here are the things which thou hast seen, okay? The things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So, Revelation, he's talking about three different categories. The things that you're seeing right now, you know, you're seeing about the seven angels, and you're seeing all this stuff. The things which are, those things that you, you are, 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 are understanding right now and are taking place right now. And then the things which shall be hereafter. The hereafter doesn't start until chapter 4, okay? That's where prophecy started was in chapter 4 of Revelation. Okay? So the things that must be hereafter are, number one, the seven seals. Number two, the seven trumpets. Number three, the seven vials, okay? There was also seven thunders, but we don't know what they are because he was told not to write about them. Plus, in between each of those things were what we call parenthetical chapters, which just means that in between telling us about the seven seals, in between telling us about the seven thunders, in between telling us about, I'm sorry, telling us about the seven trumpets, in between telling us about the seven vials, he gives us a little tidbit of some other things that are going on in between each of those. So those are parenthetical chapters. Chapters that give us a little bit of a, an understanding about certain things that are happening at that particular time. So Revelation chapter 4 is where it actually starts being prophecy about things that are going to happen, not things that have already happened, but things that are going to happen. And, and we know this, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After this I looked, because it was talking about the churches prior to that, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, it were, it were as it were a trumpet, talking with me, and he said, come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. So he's letting us know this is where the hereafter part starts, okay? So, so it's not hard. If we want to understand the book of Revelation, we just take it at its word and listen to what it's telling us and go from there. So the things which shall be hereafter are prophetic. So number one, the things which thou hast seen, okay, in chapter one, John, John sees Jesus, 
Okay, and he heard the different things. He saw him, saw what he looked like, hair, you know, hair white like wool, uh, and he saw him saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, he which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty, all of those things. So those are the things which he has seen. Then the things um, which are, and again, chapters 2 and chapter 3 represent the things which are, which are the, 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 the churches, the seven golden candlesticks, and he writes under the churches, the seven golden candlesticks, um, and so the letters to the seven churches of Asia are part of the things which are, okay? Um, history tells us that John left Patmos after uh, his exile and became uh, the overseer of those churches which were in Asia Minor, okay? He was the one that actually oversaw yeah, the churches all, of Asia Minor. All in Turkey today. Yeah. Okay. All the other churches there are or were in Turkey today. And in Turkey became a, a, a Christian country. In nowadays, it, it's, it changed. Okay. President Erdogan, um, and that's where the Ataturk Dam is, is in Turkey, where it's going to hide at, which is going to uh, uh, <laughs> cause them to be able to come across the Euphrates River dried up. Uh, is because of the Ataturk Dam, which is in Turkey. Um, the things which thou sh which shall be hereafter, Revelation 4 1 says, and, he, and, and I read that, and here's the things that are going to be hereafter. So the things that are going to be hereafter are. There are three separate accounts for the Babylon of Revelation, and we've seen what some of those are. This is, again, this is a mm -hmm. summary of everything that we've learned so far, but it's going to allow us to see them in the order that they were now so that we can understand Revelation isn't written in chronological order from chapter 1 to chapter 22. It's written in order in some of the chapters. It tells you a story up to a point. And then it starts over and tells you something up to a point, and then it starts over, and this will show you exactly that that's exactly what Revelation is. So in order to understand Revelation, you have to understand that, because if you didn't, then you would think the rapture happened several times in the book of Revelation. Or you would think earthquakes happened several times, or you would think uh, um, 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 thunderings and lightnings and voices happen several times when they don't. They happen all at one time, uh, which is at the wrath of God and the, and the, and the rapture of the church. Um, so, three accounts make up the backbone of the book of Revelation. Their stories are different, but they'll cover common uh, uh, inter intersection point. Um, and not unlike the Gospels, uh, and they're not lying like the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all cover certain things, and they tell us from a different perspective of those things. So, there are also what we call parenthetical chapters. And again, that's parenthetical means parentheses. <laughs> chapters that are kind of in parentheses in between these things happening. So they just give me a little bit of it. If you're writing a letter to somebody and you want them to know something, uh, and, and you're in the middle of writing that letter, sometimes you put something in parentheses in the middle of it just so you explain what it was I just said a little bit better, and then continue writing. That's what these are. They're they're in the middle of other stories, the seals, the vials, the trumpets. Um, yeah, the parentheses. Uh, anything inside parentheses is is to make whatever you say more clear. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's in between parentheses, mm -hmm. to make it more clear. Yep. So yep. there's a parenthetical chapters, just to make the whole, to make them, make the the whole, whole thing clear. clear. Exactly. Yeah. To make the whole thing clear. Yeah. Okay? So we call them parenthetical chapters. Um, chapter 12 is, is a parenthetical chapter. It talks about the woman clothed with the sun, you know, which we know is, number one, it was, a, it was showing us about the man child that was born, which would have been Mary giving birth to Jesus, but it also is talking about the last day because it's actually in Revelation, so it's telling us about what's going to be going on with the woman Israel who gave birth, who had the 12 stars above her head. That's a parenthetical chapter to say, hey, look, during this time period, you're also going to see these things happening to Israel. <laughs> She's going to be persecuted by the world, and, and the devil, the dragon, the old slew foot, he's going to be there trying to persecute her. Okay, just like he tried to persecute Mary when Jesus was born, or, or persecute uh, Jesus. You know, Herod came and said, "I'm going to kill all these kids between you know under the age of two and get rid of them all." Same thing is going to happen in the last day. It, 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 so, so chapter twelve is, is referring to things that were going to be hereafter, not things that were. Remember, chapter four tells us there were things that were, would be hereafter. That was chapter twelve. So those are the hereafter things. Uh, chapter thirteen is about the Antichrist and the, and the false prophet. So. We, we've learned so far about the Antichrist and false prophet and how we've, we've seen that in some of the studies that we've done. Um, so that's what chapter 13 is about. That's a parenthetical chapter, letting us know a little bit about the vials, trumpets, seals. Um, 
But these are things that are happening in between. Chapter 14 is talking about the 144,000 that were sealed away. There were, they were 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, which means the, the, the Israel itself is going to still have a remnant, okay? A group of people that have not uh, stepped away from their role as to what they're supposed to be. And even though they haven't been born of the water and of the spirit, okay? Because they aren't, they don't believe that Jesus was Messiah. Okay, they are not Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews is a Jew that believes Jesus was Messiah, and they are saved because of their 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 adherence to the Word of God and what they needed to do in order to be saved. These don't believe in that, so God is sealing them away because they still have His His initial seal of being His children. They just haven't accepted the fact that He came already. They're waiting for Him to come. So he seals them away, 144,000, uh, in, in chapter 14, okay? And after that, then you have the vials in chapter 15 and the judgment of the great whore. So we learned that the vials were poured out in chapter 15 and that how the, the great whore was, was judged in chapter 15. So if we're looking at that, if we, if it, it's so easy if we kind of make a graph of it so that we can understand how the book of Revelation actually works its way up to a certain point. So that's kind of why... I did this study this way so that you can see how things progress to a point and where that point is. So if we write it down, we know that the six seals are, 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 are the, I'm sorry, the sixth seal itself is in Revelation chapter 6, okay? Remember we talked about the, the seven seals that were going to be there? The, the seventh seal is the thousand years of peace, okay? So the sixth seal is that time period when the seven trumpets are poured out, uh, when the wrath of God is, is, is poured out, is during that sixth seal, okay? The sixth seal is in Revelation chapter 6, okay? Then we go into Revelation chapter 11, we talk about the seventh trumpet. Well, if the seventh trumpet is part of the sixth seal, okay, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be in two separate places because it also talks about the seventh seal being the thousand years of peace. Well, we know the thousand years of peace hasn't happened if, if it's in chronological order, we know that it hasn't happened yet because we haven't gotten to the thousand years of peace, okay? So we understand that Revelation is written so it ends at certain points. So the seventh trumpet also is in Revelation chapter 11. Then you have the seventh vial. Remember the vials of the wrath of God? So you have the seventh vial. That's in chapter 16, okay? The, Matthew 24 vials, also... I'm sorry, the vials is just wrath, right? The vials is the wrath just of wrath. God. And it's going to be a very quick pouring out... Um, Again, looking at everything he says, it says in one hour, this was poured out. Now, whether it's a one physical hour of your and my hour or one hour of God's time, which is you know, a little bit longer, it's still going to be a very short period of time rather than hundreds of years long, like the, the or thousands of years long, like the seals, or hundreds of years long, like the, uh, uh, the trumpets. The vials are going to happen in a very short, quick period of time. Um, and so Matthew 24 also talks about, Jesus does a lot of talking about prophecy. In Matthew 24, 23, 24, 25, he talks a lot about uh, prophecy and what's going to be taking place uh, in that time. Ezekiel 38 also talks about these same things, the same time frame. So we're going to look at all of this. And I just want you to, so I wrote it across all of the different places where it talks about earthquakes, the sun being black, the moon, the moon turned to blood, stars falling, uh, mountains and islands move, God's wrath, great voices, lightning, thunders, great hail. And we're going we're gonna to look at this and we're going to just add it to the graph wherever it fits in, okay, uh, is what we're going to do so that, so that we can understand this a little bit. So the sixth seal is in Revelation chapter 6, verses uh, 12 through 17. So let's, let's read again what it says there. And again, this is King James. Um, and I beheld when he had, okay, when he had opened, so that's why my hand is there. Must be the guy that typed it the wrong job. Um, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. So the underlying things are, are things that we're things that we're trying to take a look at and understand. And the sun became black, uh, of sack, uh, as of sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Even as a fig tree casts in her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled up together. Mm -hmm. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth 
and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. <laughs> the wrath of God. The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Okay? And who shall be able to stand? So that's in chapter 6, talking about the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is right when Armageddon takes place. Okay? So chapter 6 can't be Armageddon and then other things happen after that. So we have to understand that chapter 6 kind of ends at the Battle of Armageddon. And then it tells us about things and goes back before that again and starts giving us some information of what the other things are. So they run together is all is what I'm trying to say about the book of Revelation. Okay? So if we write down some of those things, we have a great earthquake, we had the sun becoming black, we had the moon turn to blood. In the, in the, uh, as part of the sixth seal, uh, the stars fell from heaven, the mountains and the islands were moved, and the great day of his wrath has come. So we can understand what that's, what that's saying here, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can understand that, and we can all agree that that happened in chapter 6. Okay? Um, so now if we look at chapter 11 of Revelation, in chapter 11 of Revelation, it's talking about the seventh trumpet. Okay, and remember we talked about all the six trumpets, and I showed you all the things that were happening in the world, in the earth, and how it looked like the, the, the trumpets had already blown. You know, uh, some of them had already blown, and we'll wait for the sixth trumpet to blow right now, which is the, the war that kills one third part of men. It has began to blow, uh, and it's in, in, in in process of blowing at this point, I believe. But here in the seventh trumpet, verses fifteen through nineteen, uh, chapter eleven. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. <laughs> so we're finding out now we're at that point where the worldly kingdoms that are set up are no longer going to be of themselves. They're going to become God's kingdoms. Amen. Which means we're getting ready to enter into the thousand years of peace, which is what the seventh uh, uh, seal was for a thousand years of peace. So this is at that point when the kingdoms of this world are now becoming the kingdoms of God. And he's going to rule them rather than us ruling them. So they become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign over them forever and ever. Amen. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which wast and which art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So he's going to be king now at this point over that, uh, whatever's left of the world at that point in time. So he is now going to be king over whatever remnant is left on the earth for that thousand years. And we are going to be uh, you know, kings and priests with him. The word of God says, those of us that have been baptized in his name, full of the Holy Ghost, and are living our lives righteously according to, his, you know, according to what his word says, we're going to be kings and priests teaching these people about the word of God. And the 24 elders, 24, right? Well, uh, 24 elders are the 12 prophets and the, uh, the, the 12 apostles and the 12 Tribes. Uh, tribes of, of, of Israel. Of Israel. Okay. Yeah. They're representing the 12, the 12 disciples, which is the New Testament, and right. they're representing the 12 tribes, which is the Old Testament. Right. So it's a combination of Old and New Testament. Right. The 24. That's why the number 24. Yeah. That's good. Um, most people don't understand that or know that, so that's, that's yeah. very good. Um, <laughs> I've had to teach that a lot. So who, what are the 24? Well, 12 in the Old Testament were the 12 yeah. tribes mm -hmm. of Israel. Twelve in the New Testament are the twelve disciples. So what it, what it means to me is that none of none of these men that died, they did had terrible deaths, man. They all of them, okay, like Peter, Paul, and uh, today I, I went to to work today, uh, and by accident I pressed a button, a wrong button, but it was on the official radio, and I heard a beautiful Bible study. And he did, and the, the guy, I, I want to move on and take a look because he said that that uh, Paul was betrayed by a guy named Alexander. I want to check this in the Bible, okay? It, it is, it is true. That's the, the guy gave, you know, mm -hmm. the, the tech couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't stop because I was driving. But 
Paul was betrayed in the church. Yes, he was. By a member of the church. Yes. And that member that didn't like Paul delivered Paul to the emperor. And the emperor had him killed. You know that? He betrayed by his own people. Mm -hmm. The same as Jesus. Jesus was betrayed by his own people. Paul went the same thing. Man. He wasn't betrayed by somebody out, out, out of the church. No. And not a leader. Mm -hmm. A prominent leader. Like that was a leader. As he was envious of Paul's success. Right. He delivered him to Emperor Nero. Okay. And he was killed. So by all these people, the, the prophets or the kings or whatever God has in the Old Testament and the New Testament, man, they will reign forever. Man. Yes. You know that? Yes. They will, yes. They'll, they'll be the kings, I mean, the, the governors or whatever it is, to, to, who will reign with, you know, with, with the whole with the whole world, the whole, the whole universe. Not only the earth, the whole universe. And, and, and this is something amazing that God only gave man, he didn't give the angels, you know what I mean? Could have been, no, he gave man the chance of getting to know the God Almighty, having a, a wonderful relationship, relationship with him, because the more you get close to God, the, the better you are, everything goes better, you know, because of your intimacy with the Lord, and then he grants you this benefit of, of being uh, like a king, you know, or <laughs> a, you know, a president. King you know, and priest, yes. Yeah, yeah. You're going to reign with him, you know what I mean? Amen. Forever. So this is something that you know, we always have to think about. You know, when we face the the this life, I, I just said in the, in the prayer meeting, life is not, sometimes it's really tough. Man. It's really tough. It's really tough. Okay, many when they were betrayed, or men, or many when people don't don't do what I mean, all kinds of stuff that happen in your, in your life, you know, that makes you feel upset with the world, with the people, and you feel sad. Of course, we are human beings, and that shakes us a lot. Amen. But you have to remember uh, that uh, this is temporary. Amen. And, and, and please, uh, I hope that the Holy Spirit gives you uh, this insight that you have to do something before you go. Mm -hmm. You have to do something. Shake, man. Do something for God's glory. Do something. Amen. For you when you get there to the other side, God will say, hey, good servant. Yes. You know, this yes. will happen. Yes. This will happen to us. Yes. So what are you doing here? A good and faithful servant. Oh, I cannot do this. Well, you can pray. Pray is a lot. Yes. But you gotta pray. That's right. You no, know, if you cannot move out, go out, or whatever, pray. pray. That's right. That's okay. Right. You can call people, right. talk to people. Amen. So in you know, all the knowledge you have now, you can do lots of stuff on Facebook, yes. Yes. Instagram, Amen. for God's glory. Amen. 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 You can Amen. do that. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's okay. So yes, remember that uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, okay? And we're using prophecy right now because we're in the book of Revelation. These things that are prophesied, things that are going to happen. And what was prophesied here is that the 420 elders and all those that were there, the Old Testament and the New Testament, both together, yeah. okay, in unison are saying they fell down and they worshiped God in unison and they're saying, We give you thanks. Oh Lord God Almighty. Almighty. Okay, not second person, <laughs> not somebody lesser value, not well, somebody well, sure. that's a that's a you know, somebody that's oh well you were human at one point and no, they are saying Lord God Almighty, and then they turn around and tell you now this remember this is the revelation. What the word revelation means is the unveiling. Unveiling, yes. The unveiling, the, the opening of your eyes. You talked about being blind. It's called the opening of it. It's taking the, the, the scales off your eyes so that yeah. you can see clearly. What this is telling us clearly is that the Lord God, not partial mighty, not 
co-mighty, the Lord God almighty. Amen. There's only one. He's almighty. There's only one. He's almighty. And now I'm going to tell you who he is in the very next part of this verse. Lord God almighty, which art and was and is to come. Who are we waiting to come? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Who was in the past? Jesus Christ. Who who is right now? Jesus Christ. He's the one we're waiting to he is the Lord God Almighty. Don't yeah, believe yeah. that he is a lesser person mm -hmm. in some triune system that is set up to cause us to say, wait a minute, I'm going to pray to a title rather than to pray to the one God. His name is Jesus. When we talk to him, we've got to pray, and we've got to use the power and the might of that prayer, mm -hmm. and we have power and might, what? In the name of in all that you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a revelation in the book of Revelation as to how important the name is and getting to know what that name is. Amen. Okay? We can, we can know Amen. him as the Son. We can know him as the Father and Creator. We can know him as the Holy Spirit living within us. But we have to know who he is. Amen. And he is Jesus. Okay? He's in me. He's the king the of kings. glory. The king of kings. Lord God Almighty. Yeah. So I am thankful for that. And wow. then he says, then he says and, and the nations were angry. Oh, man. Wow. Are we seeing angry nations right now? And the nations were angry. And thy wrath, that thy wrath is come. The and nations the are angry God. because God, God is going to pour out his wrath. And so they're mad at God because God's wrath. Yes is coming, and they're mad. And the time of the dead, and they, they, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, thou shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. Amen. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was a, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Wow. Okay, wow, wow, wow. this is when, when the wrath of God is being poured out. Okay, and so this is another time that we're hearing about the wrath of God being poured out. These are things. So we know the seventh trumpet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the seventh trumpet is there's going to be an earthquake. There's going to, the wrath, the wrath of God is going to be happening at the seventh trumpet. That there were great voices in heaven. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings. And there was great hail, according to that. Okay. So, so we know that those things are going to be taking place when? When the wrath of God is poured out. Okay? Now the seventh vial. Again, which is the end of that section, the vials. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. This is the vial. So this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the place where the blood's going to draw to the horse's bits. Okay? It's going to flow to the horse's bits because it's going to be so deep. In what takes place because the whole world is raw with God because he's judging them and so they're going to try to come against his people and he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue which is called Armageddon and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the, uh, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God mm -hmm. to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. And the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And instead of turning to God, they blasphemed God because God's wrath was being poured out. So we find on the seventh vial, again, there's a great earthquake. The islands fled away and the mountains were moved. God's wrath again. The great voices in the temple of heaven. Voices, thunderings, and lightnings. Great hail. And it told us that was the battle of Armageddon. So it's giving us one more piece to understand about this. So 
seeing a pattern of those things, of each of those that are ending. So they're ending at a certain point, okay? They may have been thousands of years long before that, but they're all going to end at one point in time, and that's at the Battle of Armageddon, the wrath of God. Matthew 24, Jesus is now talking in Matthew 24, because they were asking him, when, when, Lord, are these things going to happen? When is it going to be? When, when, when is the time of your coming? And in Matthew 24, he's telling them, he's telling them, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening. There's a lot of things that are going to be taking place. And he says, great tribulation will be taking place, okay, upon Israel. And when you see these things happen, come down off your housetop, don't even go into the houses, and get out of where you are, and flee, because great tribulation will come. And he says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. He goes on to say that immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the Son of Man come. He's not going to happen before the tribulation. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days. That you're going to see all this happen, and then the rapture is going to take place, is what, is what he tells us here. And so, so we look at that, and we find in Matthew 24, he says, again, the sun is darkened, this moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and immediately after, it's going to happen immediately after the tribulation. Okay? So this is all going to happen after the tribulation, not before. Okay? The tribulation of those days. Ezekiel 38. He talks about the same thing again. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel. Now we're talking about the battle of Gog and Magog. Okay? The battle of Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. This is the day when they're going to gather together in Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, which is what we call the battle of Armageddon. The valley of Megiddo. And God says, when they gather together there, my fury is going to come up in my face. He's, his wrath. Okay? For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and every wall shall fall to the ground, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all of my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. That's why the water's gonna and the blood's gonna flow to the horses' bridles. Because God's gonna will cause everyone to kill themselves. Okay? And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and uh, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So, again, Ezekiel's talking about there's going to be an earthquake on that day. Okay, mountains are going to come down, the walls are going to come down, God's wrath, great hailstones, and they called it the God Battle of Gog and Magog. So the Battle of Gog and Magog is the same as the battle of Armageddon, okay? That's when the blood's going to rise to the horse's bit. So we've learned all of these things are all going to take place when? After tribulation. After tribulation, right at the battle of Armageddon. This is when the wrath of God is going to be poured out, just prior to the battle of Armageddon. So we just have to understand. So if we understand that, that when those things are going to happen... That gives us an understanding that the book of Revelation isn't actually written in chronological order from chapter 1 to chapter 22. It gives us information up to a point in one of them, and it ends, you know, talking about the seven seals, and the seventh seal ends, okay? Then it talks about the seven uh, trumpets, and then it ends with the seventh trumpet. Then it talks about the seven vials, and it ends at the seventh vial with some other things thrown in there. So what does it teach us? The, you know, the seven-year chronological theory, uh, theory would... Because a lot of people believe the book of Revelation is written in chronological order. They believe from, from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 22 is chronological. And it's not, because if it was, in order to believe that, you would have to believe that Babylon falls twice, as opposed to falling only once. Okay, You would have to believe that the great shakings take place several times, that earthquakes take place four or five times, that the sun becomes black at least two times, that there's great yeah, hail at least two times, right. you know, <laughs> that the mountains and the islands are moved at least twice, and that God's wrath is poured out seven times. 
Yeah, it's going to be chronological. So it can't be chronological order. Okay, so this is just so that we understand that Revelations actually is not very, very chronological. Very okay, very so that's, that's what we're trying to understand so that we can understand it. So does Babylon fall once or twice? Do we know? Well, Revelation 18 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay? And in chapter 18, it says, and he cried with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils. So, in two separate chapters, if it was chronological, it would have to happen twice, because there's one's good. in chapter Thank 14 you. and one's in chapter 18. Right. So the, the, Doesn't the, happen. Okay? Right. How about earthquakes? Is there one or are there five? And again, Revelation 6 talks about the earthquake. And I beheld, and when he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. Okay? We also find in Revelation 8, 5, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay? In, in chapter 11, at the same hour, there was a great earthquake. Okay? Um, in chapter uh, 11, it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in, in his temple in the ark of his testament, and there were lightning voices, thunders, and an earthquake, and great hail. So, earthquakes, how many times do they happen? Do they happen multiple times throughout the book? Or is this a one-time a one event? And there were, uh, and there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not seen since the beginning of time. So, we know that there's only one, one set there. How many times are there, is there great darkness? Again, we can look at it in chapter 6. It said, I beheld an open sixth seal, and there was great darkness. The sun was darkened, okay? The sun became as black. In chapter 16, he says um, that the kingdom was full of darkness, okay? Um, in chapter 16. So, so we find out the darkness actually happened twice, or did it happen once? Well, it happened only once. How many times does great hail fall? Okay? <laughs> Kind of redundant here, but it's just making a point so you can understand. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, sure, yeah. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was an ark of the testament, and there was lightnings and voices and, and thunderings and great hail. Yeah. Okay. In chapter eleven and chapter sixteen, it says, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, so, every stone yeah. was about the weight of a talent, and they must be so. There was great hail. Every stone was about the weight of, a ta of one talent. Okay. So there was there was more hail there. How many times did the islands and mountains move? Okay, in chapter 6, it talks about the islands and the mountains moving. Um, they were rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. In chapter 16, it says, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Right. Okay, so it's just letting us know that it's not um, chronological. It, it, there's pieces so that we can understand it. And then, uh, again, the wrath of God is poured out several times, and we can go through all that, but let's uh, redeem a little bit of time. Um, and the third angel falls saying, with a loud voice, and the wrath of God... Again, a couple of more times, the, and these are just the verses, so I'm going to go up there for a second so you can see them, um, of where the wrath of God was poured out. There was se seven times that the wrath of God was declared to be poured out, okay? Uh, so, does the wrath of God get poured out seven times, or is it referring to the same instance, but it tells you about it seven times at the end of exactly. each thing that's taking place, okay? So, in summary, John characterized everything in three categories. <laughs> we learned that. Not all of Revelation is prophetic. We learned that. There are three different accounts given uh, uh, for an intersection point of the Battle of Armageddon, and that is uh, seals, uh, trumpets, and vials. Revelation is not in chronological order from the, from the beginning to the end. The sixth seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial are all the same event, the wrath of God. Okay? It begins immediately after the tribulation and is when Armageddon is fought. Okay, the battle of Gog and Magog is that same battle. Okay, so to understand or to, to wrap up, you know, this so that so that we have a an idea or, or an understanding of this, if we can understand that the book of Revelation is written in a way that we could read one piece and then say, okay, it ends here, and then read another piece and say it ends here, and read another piece and say it ends here, then why isn't the word of God, the whole word of God, why, why can't we take that same concept with the whole word of God and say, hey, look, the word of God may tell us something here, and it was referring to one particular item, and now over here it says the same thing, and it's referring to the same end point, and that is, let's say it's, let's say it's salvation. <laughs> let's say, let's say it's, it's all salvation, because I firmly believe that the word of God, if, they, if, if it's something that God wants us to know and to understand, It'll be more than one place. 
Okay? It'll be in more than one place when you study the Word of God. It'll be in more than one reference to it. If you find just one reference to a particular thing, chances are your interpretation of that is wrong because the Word of God will tell us multiple times about something. He tells us that we must be born again. Jesus said, Jesus said to, uh, to, to uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John, uh, St. John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus came to him in, in, in the night and, and said to him, what must I do in order to be saved? What do I have to do? And Jesus, Jesus told him, he said, you must be born again. You know, verily, verily, I say unto you, you know, you know, that, that, um, you know uh, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can I be born again? <laughs> can I climb into my mother's womb and be born again a second time? And Jesus says, no, 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 you're not understanding me. You've got to be born of the water and of the spirit. Okay, so he's telling him what that born again experience is. It's repenting, dying out to old you, and then being born of water. In other words, you have to be baptized. Okay, and then being born of the spirit. You have to be full of the Holy Ghost. That's what we should be striving for. We look in the book of Acts, the same thing. In the book of Acts, uh, Peter says, hey, you know, or actually the, the, the people that were there said to Peter, you know, when they found out that, that they had just crucified Messiah and, and what was going on in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, you know, uh, that, that great celebration that was taking place, the day of Pentecost that was taking place, they saw what was going on and they said, Wow, what is this? And he explained to them exactly what it was. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. <laughs> I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh in the last day. And he says, and, they, and he said, that same Jesus whom you crucified, God made him both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their hearts, verse 37 says, and they said to Peter, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said to them, you must repent, verse 38, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he's telling them the same thing. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. We read in, 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 in chapter uh, 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 chapter 10 where there were a group of people, in the book of Acts chapter 10, where there were a group of people that were believers. Okay? And, 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 and um, he gave them alms to the poor. Many alms to the poor. And yet he had to be told in chapter 10 that he had to be born of the water and of the spirit. Okay? It was more in chapter 19. Here's a group of people that were baptized now. They were already baptized even in chapter 19 of the book of Acts. They were already baptized. And Paul came to them at Corinth, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and he said, finding certain disciples, he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So, number one, they already believed. And number two, they were already baptized. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. I don't know what you're talking about. Is there such a thing, a Holy Ghost? And Paul said to them, unto what then were you baptized? So because they believed, they were, he knew they were baptized because every believer got baptized. It wasn't, you can get baptized. No, every believer got baptized. There was no question on whether they got baptized or not. Every believer got baptized. And so he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't heard whether there be one. Well, then under what then were you baptized? Well, we were baptized under John's baptism. He said, well, John just baptized you or verily baptized you in the baptism of repentance. That's the first step, repent. He said, but he commanded that they get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, they had to get rebaptized. They were already baptized, but they didn't take on the name yet. They took on the reference. They took on the reference because John said, I verily baptize you in the name of the one that will come after me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. So he had the reference to Jesus, but he never used the name. And because the name wasn't used in chapter 19, they had to get rebaptized in the name because it was so important. So the Word of God is telling us all of this stuff, and it gives it to us in multiple ways so that we can't miss it. And then when we come before the throne of God, and we stand there and we say, Lord, I'm here, take me. And he says, no, you didn't take my name. No, 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 I did. I took your name. No, no, you, you didn't actually take my name. And, and, and he's going to look at you and he's going to say, I gave you every opportunity to see it. I gave you every opportunity. You didn't pay attention. Blind. What yeah, did you uh, say? Uh, Blind. So go ahead. I was I was paying attention to what 
especially for us to see now. And also upon the word of God, when it says the whole world, some many nations were mad at God because yes. of his wrath. Of, yes. Uh, and I understand this because of the people I've been around with. Uh, people don't believe in God at all, man. They don't believe in God at all. And they think what they think is right. They think they are, their conception of justice is better than our God's conception of justice. You know what I mean? They think they are, they are right. And their conception of right or wrong is their conception that is right. Well, so when you try to talk about the Bible, they think that we are too naive. That we are too naive. That we, we are too innocent. That we are like kids before them. They are the educated. They are the one who know that who have the light. And that we are the the fools. Because we believe in the word of God. And we believe in, in a God that they don't believe at all. And when he, the, the wrath of God is going to finally come upon the earth, upon many, many people, billions of people, and many of those educated, I don't mean about the, the, the problem is with those educated people all over the world. They will not, instead of repenting, they will feel mad at God because <laughs> they consider themselves Intelligent, say, yeah, exactly. what God is this? Yeah. You know, how can the how, what how can he do this to me? You know, I did nothing. I was no, this was my perception of right and wrong, and now he comes like this and he's, and he just what how can that be? So they judge God upon what God is judged them. <laughs> and there's no more chance anymore. But anyway, but even then they should have said no, they they until the end they think that, oh, God is too wrong. God is wrong. Until the end. Oh, they do. God they is do. wrong. Here. They're right. They're yeah. going to go to hell, but they're right. God is wrong. God should have been a good God. Uh -huh. God should have been forgive them for what they did. No hell. It, it saved them. That's what they would think until the end. Mm -hmm. You know? And they could think that is this. The battle of Armageddon or the Gog and Magog, God did not use anybody. Yeah, God always used men. He used uh, um, uh, David. He used Samson. He used Deborah, the judge. He used people to fight. Yes. Not this battle. Right. Nobody's gonna fight the battle. God Himself will be He doesn't need anybody. So this time He showed. He said, "Listen, I did all by myself. I didn't need anybody." Right. And He'll fight all all the nations, and just Jesus, just Jesus Christ will fight. Only Jesus Christ. Nobody else. And he'll destroy them all. Okay? And what really gets me really sad because I, we love the people, man. That's right. That's you know, right. What, what do, do, that's right. You know, this is why I, listen, I watch, I watch, and I recommend you to watch people who died clinically and went to hell. Believe it. It's true. Because oh, I don't believe. It's true. It's true, man. Don't say, the devil. The devil makes you not to, to believe. This is what he does. Oh, this thing doesn't exist. You cannot go die on a surgical table and go to hell and come back. Oh, listen. This is exactly what the devil wants people not to believe. Right. Only the devil wants that. God, of course, wants to believe. Because the most difficult thing nowadays, the most difficult thing is to People believe that, that, that hell is real. They That's don't right. believe it. That's Nobody right. believes it, man. I share the gospel to, to many people. Thank God. Wherever I go, I go. Don't believe hell. No, no, no. So when you see on the YouTube people who died surgically, and he, no, the spirit came out, and they went to hell, man. You should see. You should watch, watch man. Watch what they say about hell, man. He tell me if it's not true. They went there, man. And they got desperate because they went to hell. And somehow, God heard because their mother was a Christian, their parents were a Christian. Somebody, somebody was praying for them. And Jesus Christ took them from hell and gave him a last chance. Mm. A last chance. Mm. Okay? Because you should watch those videos, man. You don't say that it's not real. It is real. It is real.
Okay, God never took me to hell, heaven or to hell. He took me to heaven once. But I saw heaven and didn't see hell. And sometimes I say, if God prepares me, prepare God, I don't want to go to hell or hell. But, but if it is necessary for me to save people, mm. he can prepare me, man, because I'm going straight to hell. Because I'm sure that I will see what people saw. Yes. I will yes. see hell as is, man. A lake of people suffering with fire and the demons soak them with fire and you know and, and weeping them you know and this is this is hell man and you know so sometimes i watch those things to remind me that i'm nothing <laughs> i'm nothing man. and if i don't yeah. live according to the bible i might end up there exactly exactly anybody here me him exactly. anybody all of us there's no difference that's right okay because we have to see that i don't want to i don't i man I don't want to go to hell at all. No. <laughs> at all. Okay? And I don't want God to see me from there. And I'm here lying, stealing, creating problems, giving great divisions, great decisions, or you know, judge somebody, or, you know, people, God is watching me, man. Whatever we do. And then we die, and they got say, okay, I'm sorry, my friend, but you didn't make it. <laughs> Sit well. Oh, but did this, no matter. God's God is never, never, is never wrong. God is never wrong. That's right. God is never wrong. Agreed. While we're here, we have time to repent. We have time to do what God wants us to do. We have time to change all those, those nasty things we have. Everybody has something. Nasty. Then we have to change. Yes. Okay. So don't judge uh, people. People want perfection from me, from him, from you, from all the others. I, you know, you, why don't you desire your own perfection? <laughs> why do you want me to be perfect, or him to be perfect, or her to be perfect? How about you? How about yourself? Okay. You gotta think about yourself, man. That's right. You have been perfect. Amen. The yes. others are for the others. Okay. It, 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 that's what happens to people. People think everybody. It's bad, but you are always good. You're never bad. You yourself are never bad. I know. I'm a good guy. I'm a good <laughs> man. I'm never. No, no, I'm going to heaven. Amen, no, amen. I'm, if I, my, my, pastor, my pastor, my pastor, this is my pastor, this, my pastor, that, my brother, Rick, my sister, Wanda, my Joe, uh, but me, no. I'm safe. There's <laughs> something, Frank Chris. Okay? He's perfect, but anybody else is not perfect. But, but that's the problem with many people. Many people. That we have to be humble, man. See, I'm a sinner. And I have to fight, man. This is fighting. It's a war. Yes, it is. God saved me on the cross. But I have to give fruit. I have to resemble something that God did, man. Yeah. I have to, people have to see you, man. Not only a religious person. No. But I have to see you that there's... God in your eyes. There's God in your mind. Mm -hmm. There's God in your thoughts. Yes. That you care about God's kingdom. That you're worried about people's souls. You're worried. I got very upset that, uh, I, no names. I want to go on an outreach program around here. And some of the people here told me they don't want to go because they never did that. It is not their custom. This is not a main issue, a main, a culture. Come on, man. So I'm not going man. around is not the, the uh, this church culture, uh, this culture background. I said, man, what's, what's the name of this people? Okay, so you can go around to invite people to come to a craft fair. Yeah. French fair, people go everybody, make preference, go there, and now when I go out to reach, no. No, no, don't share the gospel, no. We don't do that. I felt really mad, man. I mean, I'm sorry, but upset. Um, with the darkness, blindness, it's chaos. People go and fight for events, social events. 
uh, for night, and now we want to go around share the gospel. And people say, no, this is not our church. This is not our church. This is not our church. You know? But you never know what's inside. You know, somebody, these people you meet, if they're wonderful people, they come to the craft fair, they're good, you know, any person you meet out there, you don't know how hungry they are. What's God loves them, he, just like he loves us. He loves everybody. So, you know, it is, it might be embarrassing if you talk to somebody and they refuse you, but at least you've tried. Right. At least you've tried to share with them something that 